Hello. This lecture is about the avant-garde. It's about these changes that took place in jazz in the late 1950s, but much earlier in other forms of music, the general classical music type of ideas, where what we would probably call the norms of the music changed tremendously. In the readings, we compared this to uh, the pictures, and we talked about how, you know, for probably since the beginning of time, art was representative. It represented something. It could be done in a variety of different ways, but it still was a bowl of fruit, a portrait, whatever. And then art started to get a little bit more abstract, and these representations became less and less obvious until finally all representation was lost. <clears throat> it's interesting that even with some of the most abstract art, uh, people still try to make sense of it, if you want to put it in that way. A number of studies have shown this, that you know, human beings, we like order. And we can show something that has really no intrinsic meaning in it, and yet we'll look at that and we'll go, well, I think that's, uh, that's a dog chasing a cat, or that's, a, that's an elephant uh, eating a banana. You know, we, we try to make order of things. But often the artists aren't looking for order. They're just saying, this is what we have. In the musical world, the norms of the three that I mentioned, maybe the four, <clears throat> we have a singable melody. We have chords that are tonal, they make sense, and they go with the melody. recurring beat. We have rhythm. Those elements, those three elements, really are part of almost all music until the 20th century. I also mentioned in there the use of uh, recognizable timbres and used in recognizable ways. We recognize the piano, but we may recognize it a little bit less if I was to go using it in an unusual way. That's something else that the avant-garde musicians started to do. Take normal instruments and use them in extreme ways and also bring in instruments that were not so common. How do we mess with this? We mentioned the 12 tone idea. 12 tones of the piano. That's 12. Schoenberg's idea said, well, we need to order these some way. There had been kind of musical chaos before this. We'd already had a lot of atonal music where there was do whatever you want to do. He wanted a system. And his system said, come up with a row of 12 pitches. Put it in your order and then use that for your movement. Use that for your piece. The 12 tone method of writing really held forth for about 50 years very strongly, especially in academic settings like universities. So, along with this atonal sound of the melody, we're not going to put regular chords to that. So, regular chords became, you know, we just didn't use them anymore. We still have combinations of notes but they would often sound uh, often very complex, uh, sometimes very, um, no, what would be a good word? Mm, very crunchy in sounds. kind of representation of atonal music. I can, I can make it much more uh, dramatic. Very dramatic. 
and very atonal. There's no real key center, there's no real melody. There's a lot of sounds, kind of like artistic designs, but using just the sounds of the piano. <clears throat> the third part is rhythm. And I mention a composer and I give an example, Elliot Carter, because he is one of the few first people to really take a different look at rhythm. Because even with all the atonal sounds that are going on, and even though we had quite a few rhythmic changes, music was still pulse oriented. I mean, even Stravinsky, when he did his Rite of Spring sound, and he used all these changing meters and changing patterns, we still wind up with a sense of pulse. We have this underlying sound. You know, Stravinsky's music is, is very rhythmic. It just organizes it in a different way. Schoenberg, Weber, and all these 12-tone composers of the 20s, 30s, and 40s, most of it's still very rhythmic. A few people started to move away from that. Carter comes along in the early 1950s, and his music is very precise. It's all written out. Every note, uh, very atonal, doesn't use the 12-tone system. But his idea of rhythm was that it should be constantly moving. And it should be personal. As I mentioned there, the violist in the string quartet plays a set of rhythms that are unique to the violist. And the, the violin too plays rhythms that are unique to them. So each one has its own character. But what he doesn't use very often is this sense of pulse. So very complex rhythms, but they seem to just be moving forward and backwards, getting faster, getting slower, sometimes two different rhythms at the same time, but no pulse. for melodies and the chords that he used, but the sense of rhythm was the cool thing with Carter. Carter's won the Pulitzer Prize. He just passed away at the age of, I think, 102, and a uh, dramatic composer, very, very influential. This is what we mean by, though, the avant-garde. We've taken those norms of music, melody, rhythm, tonality, and in some cases, texture, the musical sounds, and we've, we've changed them to such an extent or thrown them out. And that's a very, very unusual sound. Now we've accepted certain parts of this. We accept atonal music, believe it or not, in some of our most commonplace occurrences, which are movies and television. Usually for drama, usually for horror. I mean, we all know this sound. represents. It's cliche now, all right? But if you go back to the music of the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, even in the 60s, the drama music was very tonal. It was, it was much more like uh, late of um, uh, Mahler music and stuff. I mean, it's like tonal, it's dramatic. But then they started to get in there with those types of sounds, you know, the stabbing sounds of Hitchcock's films, Bernard Herrmann's sounds. We start to accept that. We have a little problem with atonal music trying to come up with something beautiful. And we'll say that's probably the big issue. No problem with tension. No problem with drama. Not all atonal music is arrhythmic. Very rhythmic. And if you're not listening too closely, it may even sound somewhat normal. In the jazz world, what do we have? We've got Ornette Coleman who comes along. He doesn't change too much, especially at the beginning, but he does put it into a free form so you do not have to follow chords. In fact, he gets rid of the piano player. You know, I didn't have a lot of gigs with Ornette. <laughs> so without a chordal instrument, you're free to play whatever you want to play. But it still sounds very jazzy. He's using jazz instruments. He's using jazz rhythms. The, the bass player is often walking. Very 
jazzy. And that would be Ornette. Cecil Taylor, on the other hand, kind of did things differently. His music of the 50s and the late 50s kind of sounds that way. But Cecil loved a couple things, more so than anybody else before or since, I think. One thing he loved to do is to play unbelievably fast. His technique is unbelievable. And I've seen Cecil Taylor live twice. Long programs, you know, piano players in the audience are just, our hands are hurting after about 20 minutes of watching him play, but he just keeps going. Very fast lines. <laughs> kind of making this up. When you listen to Cecil's playing, he has these motives that he's worked out. He's got things that are like, like Beethoven sounds, atonal Beethoven. He's nailing it every time. The video that you have with this particular reading of Cecil, if you listen carefully, you'll see him repeat these figures over and over again. He, he's going for the same note. Just amazing technique. Wonderful, exciting player. The other thing he liked, the cluster. And he turned the cluster into a primary motivic element. All those things you've wanted to do since you were three years old and you first got your hands on a piano, that's what Cecil Taylor does. And he does it in an amazingly exciting way. He changes it so much. A lot of Cecil Taylor's music doesn't sound like jazz, in my opinion. And that's one of the points that we make about this and the idea of the labeling of Cecil Taylor as a jazz musician. Because his music tends to go much more toward even like an Elliot Carter sound at times. Very atonal, has nothing to do with even jazz rhythms. Is that really jazz music? Well, I guess, I guess it just depends on who's making the uh, designation. I, I know I could take a lot of Cecil Taylor's music and take it to conservatories that just deal with classical music, and they would have they would just assume it was a contemporary composer, not a contemporary jazz composer. That's the essence of the musical avant-garde. I mentioned that I disagree with Mark Gridley's approach to the avant-garde in a couple ways. And I've pretty much demonstrated what I think those ways are. Avant-garde is just a general term meaning something new. That's all right, but we don't really think of that. You say, well, I'm listening to avant-garde music. We tend to think of that as being music that has these elements, a certain amount of atonalism, new sounds that were not normal, uh, angular melodies, things that are really outside the norm. There's no doubt that the innovations of people such as Bill Evans were new in the 1960s, but his music doesn't exhibit any of these characteristics. It's very tonal. It has uh, you know, beautiful, very singable melodies. You know, the fact that he allows his rhythm section a lot more freedom does not, in my mind, make him part of the avant-garde the way most people in the music world consider the term avant-garde. We have to add to that that idea of the abstractness. And what is abstract about music? When you really mess with the melody, when you turn things into atonal harmony, when you get rid of that musical pulse.